I'm going to talk about curiosity, landscape, uh, and geography. I'm going to start by asking you all a simple question, which is uh, this one, which is what actually has triggered your engagement with the natural world? Go back to your youth. If it was your youth when this happened, what turned you on to the natural world? Was it a fantastic teacher? Was it a community activity? Was it inspirational parents? Was it a friend? Who was that motivating force? And what were the motivating feelings that you had that triggered that engagement? Because I'm going to be talking to you today not about engaging policymakers, but engaging people beyond those that we normally reach. And that's part of the talk. So what is it that actually um, triggered your engagement with the natural world? Was it awe, as here in the Kaitor Falls, the largest single water drop of, uh, sort of fall of water in the world? Was it uh, in the Yubari Sand Sea? Uh, beauty, the fascination in the natural world, our landscape, which actually the, the symmetry in that is not by chance, it's because of vortices and flows in the wind that repeat themselves. Was it in terms of respect, respect for the biodiversity we have on our planet here, humpback whales, bubble net feeding in Frederick Sound in Alaska? Was it a sense of adventure, uh, kayaking amongst this landscape again in Alaska, and seeing the icebergs in terms of their seasonal melt, not in terms of climate change, floating down the waterways was a fantastic experience. Is it heritage that turns you on? Prehistoric landscapes like those in Britain, uh, the Uffington White Horse goes back several thousands of years, evocative landscapes. Is it perhaps empathy with the plight of indigenous peoples across the world, and none more so perhaps than the uh, Mongolian nomads, the pastoral nomads, the largest population of pastoral nomads left in the world. It's uh, half the population of Mongolia are still engaged in uh, pastoral nomadism. And you can see the scale of this picture. If you look down at the bottom, sorry, I've got a pointer on here, haven't I? If you look down there, just above Brett's head, can you see that? That's a tent. That's a single gare, that's a single pastoral nomad in this vast, vast landscape in the southern Gobi Desert. Uh, was it indeed um, threat that triggered your interest in the natural world? Example here, closer to home from the Tewkesbury floods. Was it concern for indigenous populations and peoples who find themselves increasingly threatened in many ways, in culturally and in terms of the spaces and places that they occupy and their access to land. Here we have one of the eagle hunters from Kazakhstan, um, and they, they, this is in Western Mongolia. Uh, so the future of cultural diversity, I would say, is not ultimately as important as biodiversity on which we all depend, but it is fantastically important nevertheless. Was it shock? I have to say, this is a rare picture from the Middle Hills of Nepal, where I worked for 10 years uh, studying soil erosion. Uh, it's quite difficult. The farmers there do look after their lands really rather well. But shock of the sort of pictures like this you see in the media, deforestation, uh, soil erosion, degraded land. Was it science that actually turned you on? We live, ladies and gentlemen, in an amazing world. It's our responsibility to sustain it. We live at a time of privilege, probably in some ways the best time. And as I'll show later, we also live at a tipping point, I think, globally, the tipping point, probably, in terms of the last 20,000 years since the end, or the beginning of the end of the last ice age. Underpinning all of what turns you on, I really believe, is curiosity. Whatever it was, whoever it was, it's curiosity that we need to sustain in young people. Robert Winston, it's not my idea, it's Robert Winston's, of course, he bangs on about education and the role of education to sustain and inspire curiosity in young people. I'm not an advocate for skills-based learning. Skills are important. Knowledge is just as important. But if we can unlock curiosity, we can unlock young people. What turned me on as a kid was a fantastic geography teacher um, who fed my curiosity 
and a passion for landscape. Uh, I'm a geographer. I hope there's some geographers in the audience today. I'm going to talk to you. Did I hear a yes? Um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, the theme that runs through this is landscape. Take this landscape here on the South Downs. It has, it's a palimpsest of our history and our environment. You might, some of you here, be concerned about whether there's a cuckoo there, deforestation. Um, you may actually be concerned about the microclimates that exist in those wonderful shoots that you can see here on the scarp face of the South Downs. You may, as a geographer, for example, be more interested in how those shoots actually formed, and it's probably by avalanches um, during uh, the trans some of the transition phases at, at, uh, at, in the Ice Age. You may, if you're a geologist, be more interested in the creation of the scarp itself. And if you're an archaeologist concerned with people, then the earthworks on the top that you can see here will be of particular interest to you. So you can start to see how landscapes are an integrating way of looking at the, di the, the dynamics, in a sense, between people, uh, nature, and also, if it's an urban landscape in particular, uh, economy. Another landscape that fascinates me, and the UK has wonderfully complex landscapes. In terms of scale here, this is the Dub Valley, that's one of our large electricity pylons. And this is a landscape of ridge and furrow. It's a landscape of exploitation economically. It's a landscape of peasant farmers ploughing their lands or their strips of land year after year to create that beautiful feature in the landscape, but it represents to a large degree, oppression. So my f end of the first part of my talk is simply to say landscape is central to our lives, I believe. Um, whether they are central to our lives in terms of a pragmatic factor that we live in landscapes, we, our livelihoods are in landscapes, and we take our leisure in landscapes, that gives us an opportunity to engage people through landscape. Whether it's because our landscapes are sucker us in terms of their natural resources and their biodiversity, or whether it's because um, they provide us with resilience to change, as in the case of salt marshes at our coast, equivalent to tropical mangroves in the way that they operate, or threat in terms of flooding. And um, perhaps most importantly, landscapes are part of us. When you think of your identity, when you think of where you come from, where you think of where you grew up, do you think of a landscape? I do. I think of East Anglia. Great big skies. That's part of me. That's part of our, my identity. And landscapes then offer us a perspectives on the past, the present, and the future. Now, come to the topic, really, of your conference here today. And uh, it's... Uh, the, the, the interface of people, economics, and um, sorry, I've now lost my oath, sod it, I'm just going to ad lib. The, um, <laughs> the interface of society, economy, and the environment has been around for a long time, hasn't it? It was Brundtland in the 1970s that per first put this on our agenda. Um, it is a little different, but not very different from your people, economics, and nature. And I don't imagine that's um, a random change. I think you're personalizing it. I haven't talked to you about it. I think you're personalizing it down from the generic down to the individual, the people, the economics, and the nature. And we've heard a lot, and we know a lot, all of us around this room, about the ways in which people and economics are putting increasing pressure on our world. It's just been referred to. Um, for example, uh, the UN population report uh, out last week, we had two very interesting responses to that. Uh, Jonathan Porritt in The Independent uh, weighed in behind the fact that overpopulation was the elephant in the room, and it's the, it's, it's the big issue that we've yet to get to grips with, and nobody has dared to do it. Uh, while at the same time, over in The Guardian, George Monbiot was banging on about consumption that it's not the numbers of people, it's their levels of consumption, and raising the spectre of middle-class growth in China and India and uh, dramatically increased levels of consumption uh, as we go forwards uh, towards the end of the century. And of course, we then have to draw those scenarios as to what this means. Does it mean, and I would argue uh, we are at a, a, a point of real concern, 
about the way in which that is going to impact on nature, biodiversity loss, ecosystem services. I think it's going to be stretched to breaking point, and many commentators have also said that, while at the same time, nature will also exert its own pressures in terms of ramped up environmental processes associated particularly with climate change, sea level, ocean acidification, uh, extreme events being more frequent, uh, land productivity declining. And the key point about this is that it's, yes, it will happen globally, but it's also very spatially different. And that's where your job, one of the ways in which your geography actually comes into play. Now, in this interplay of those three forces, and of course, sustainability sits, I don't need to tell you this, sits right in the middle there. Who are the key players who we are interacting with? There are many. I'm just going to pick three. First off, we have our conservationists seeking sustainability, seeking to sustain biodiversity. You folk in the room. <coughs> I thought I needed to put a few cartoons in. If you can't read it, I'm sorry. It says, the government has scaled down the forest sell-off. So your campaigning activities, thankfully, uh, were enormously productive with regard to that particular issue. Secondly, our policymakers seeking politically sustainable balances or politically acceptable balances. Uh, I'm not going to get into a political discussion about this, but I thought this cartoon captured it very well. Uh, it's settled then. We agree to sign a pledge. We hold another meeting to consider changing course at a date yet to be determined. Um, and thirdly, of course, why am I standing here? It's the scientists. It's those who are pushing the boundaries of knowledge. And I would say geographers are central to that. I would, wouldn't I? I am one, but genuinely so. It is the discipline that sits at the interface of uh, the economy, people, and nature. It's the multidisciplinary discipline, in a sense. We have human geography, physical geography, and the society-environment relationships. It's quite obvious, in a sense, that it does sit there, but it doesn't necessarily have the prominence, historically, uh, that uh, arguably it, it should have. It's an integrating science. It speaks, it can speak to other uh, scientists and, and social scientists. If you've ever tried to get a sociologist, a geologist, or an environmental scientist, and an economist in a room talking the same language, you'll probably recognize that you've struggled. Certainly, we've struggled. And that's, in a sense, the ability and skill of the geographer to integrate across those disciplines and to bring their own perspective, to bring a spatial perspective. We're the dirty subject. We get our feet on the ground. We understand how those three sets of processes and forces affect places differently and affect people differently. We're concerned about vulnerable areas. We're concerned about equity. So it's the spatial rollout, locally and globally, that is particular interest uh, to geographers in this domain. And as I said, I think we're probably at the most important tipping point in the last 20,000 years in, in that period with multiple stakeholders trying to battle with complex issues where you have a perfect storm of population increase, economic development, particularly in India and China, and the pressures that's placing on our ecosystem services and on our natural environment. Never has it been so important to do, to act. And arguably, if we don't do so soon, uh, we will have a much, much, much bigger job to do, perhaps an impossible one, in the future. Now, of course, geography has its detractors. And uh, this, uh, we came, I applied for Olympic tickets, and they offered me a place to read geography at Sheffield. And um, then there's the one about... Uh, so much for today's biology lesson on intelligent design turned now to the subject of intelligent geography and the flat earth. However, it's undergoing a renaissance. And you'll see here the covers of two recent reports. Uh, the first one is uh, the Na uh, National Ecosystems Assessment, UK National Ecosystems Assessment Report. And we were delighted that 
the cultural valuing of ecosystems, part of that report was led by a team of geographers, just in a sense recognising the ability to work across people uh, and the environment. And likewise, uh, the uh, foresight, latest foresight report on migration and global environmental change released last week um, in the House of Commons. Uh, out of the six expert panel members, four were geographers, and it was led by Richard Black, geographer at the University of Sussex. I think those two, and perhaps this list, which is some of the research areas that the geography community, I think, of relevance to you here, are currently engaging with. Um, well, I've mentioned cultural value of ecosystems, environmental change, migration, and urban growth, and bringing urban growth into that equation is critically important. But there are many others, too, from using... Uh, new technologies such as geographic information systems, working with indigenous communities, uh, as Jerome Lewis does from University College London, working with indigenous communities in Africa to map and, and share the information with others about their natural resources, and particularly to share that information with potential developers and with political decision makers. Risk, resilience and tipping points is a focus in Durham University Geography Department and uh, energy security at Leicester, food security at Gloucestershire, um, global environmental change, poverty in the role of women, Katie Willis and many others too uh, at Royal Holloway, tropical forest fire and sustainable agriculture. We have Mike Hans in Cambridge. Uh, we have Joss Barlow up at Lanc Lancaster. And the list goes on. And I, I really just wanted to show you, there's much more too. I wanted to show you the way in which geographers contribute and the discipline contributes at that critical interface, uh, which is the subject of your conference. But of course, communication uh, is central to uh, that role. Uh, if we can do the research and support some of the work that you're doing, we absolutely need people uh, who can communicate across the many different audiences. Whether that's communicating verbally or communicating visually. And this is uh, some work that's been done um, by Danny Dawling up in Sheffield, actually, um, uh, the, where the territory size shows the proportion of worldwide ecological footprint which is made there. So this is his world mapper. I'd now like to move on, I think, to say a little bit in the few minutes I have remaining about the society and its role. Now, um, I, this is a hopeless diagram, but it simply goes to say that the society engages with policymakers, um, with supporting research and expeditions, with geography in the workplace, those of you who are practicing your geography, as some of you are here, uh, through a professional accreditation. But the area I want to talk about is the work that we're doing to unlock curiosity and enthuse and inspire young people and particularly those people who are, we call in a sense, hard to reach. It's not the Radio 4 listeners, I'm sorry guys, it's the others who, who are out there. And I'm just going to pick up two or three themes. One of those is um, education. Vitally important that we enthuse young people at school to study geography. Why? Because it's the only place in the curriculum they get sensible environmental science, largely, and particularly the only place where people, environment, and economy, processes and dynamics come together and, to a degree even at school, at GCSE and A-level, are taught uh, in, in something like an integrated way. Geography, uh, the government is currently deciding whether it's going to be part of the national curriculum. We think it will be. We'd like you to support that discipline because the roots of young people understanding at school, much of the sorts of issues and the interface you're talking about comes from the discipline. Fortunately, most geography lessons are not like this and we have a lot of satisfied customers. Um, but beyond the classroom, field work and expeditions are hugely motivational. Uh, we support in, in the society something like 90 expeditions a year to all corners of the world. And here we're beyond school, we're really into university, masters and, and subsequent levels. Um, we support them in a whole raft of ways, but actually experiencing and working in an environment with local people, feet on the ground, understanding the local issues, whether it's around biodiversity loss or flooding or urban encroachment or whatever it is, there is no better learning ground than actually 
in the field. And the Society, the RGS, has been supporting expeditions, is the heart of our mission, advancing geographical science. We've been supporting them since 1830 with some very famous ones. But finally, and very quickly, just to talk in a few ways about how we are engaging people in Britain, um, youngsters in Britain, through landscape. Uh, through exhibitions, outdoor activities, and to a degree, I'll, I'll probably uh, drop off the last two. In terms of exhibitions, did anybody here go to Bath, Britain from the Air? Yeah. Did you enjoy it? Yeah, good. Okay. Well, that's our attempt to get some, tell some of the important stories through engaging people with, with, through, through art and through imagery. So the, the, the approach here is to have 100 large images of fantastic built natural uh, landscapes across Britain and in the readable captions below to tell some of the stories about sustainability, about consumption, about use of resources. So we pull people into a fascinating picture, explain, tell stories, and it's story-led, um, and, and then have some fun too, uh, which is around a giant map. It uh, reached, uh, the feedback, sorry, has been phenomenal, and I don't have time to go through this in detail, but I'll just show you the first couple. It was the most visited and viewed exhibition last year in Britain. It had 4.5 million visitors to that free exhibition, which was fantastic. It reached a potential media audience of 25 million. And on the back of that, we have some walking initiatives. Um, Discovering Britain is a walks website that we're launching with geographical walks. These walks that tell an integrated story about our landscapes. Um, and that will be launched before Christmas. And then Walk the World, which was launched this week with Nick Crane, um, is the geographer's I spy in the landscape. So let me just test you. Those four pictures there, pantiles on a roof, an apple tree, wheat in a wheat field, and a pound, a Victorian pound for runaway animals in a village. It's a wonderful English countryside. Pantiles originated in the Netherlands. They came across in boats as ballast, uh, boats that were buying wool, uh, purchasing wool to take back to Europe. The apple originated in Tajikistan and Kazakhstan, wheat, uh, started to be grown from wild grasses in Jordan and Syria 10 and 11,000 years ago. And uh, the mouflon, the wild mouflon, the original sheep actually came out of the Caucasus, Iran and Iraq. So we think our geography I spy, find, go. So the call has been find your local links to the 206 participating nations in the Olympics and the Paralympics, log them on Walk the World, we'll create a giant map and you can go explore your local links in your neighborhood. What have I tried to do here today? Um, to suggest to you that one of the ways that people, and particularly those who don't naturally buy into or want to understand issues around biodiversity or are turned off by hearing too many stories of doom and gloom, um, that to suggest to you that for some people at least, landscape offers a soft way in to appreciating uh, the interface of nature, people, and economy for non-specialists. And that's what we're trying to do with some of our public outreach work. Hook people in, then feed in the stories. Secondly, that geography is, I would say, the, it's A, it's an important, but it's a vitally important subject at this interface of people, economics, um, and... Uh, What's the other one? I've now forgotten. It's, it's uh, a vital interface um, for the conference um, topics and themes that, that, that you're dwelling on. And thirdly, communicating and advocating for geography at school and for field work is vital. If we lose it properly, if we lose it from the curriculum, then young people are not going to have that introduction to understanding the environment, people's interactions with it, economic processes and their interactions with it, and how that affects people throughout the world. So I hope 
I've engaged you a little bit. I hope you've got a message about geography and we'll look at that afresh. And I very much hope that our networks can work together around reaching some of those, if you like, hard to reach communities out there. Thank you.